Amen. Praise God. Good morning, church. You may take a seat. I'm happy that you uh, were able to join us this Sunday for some amazing time spent in prayer, worship, and studying God's Word. Um, today we're continuing our series. We're continuing our uh, series on questions and answers. A series that we titled Q&A, and as you've heard Pastor Ed in the beginning already mention, that today is the second part of the topic on relationships, uh, a relationship with God. So last Sunday, uh, we discussed the idea, or the, just the idea of what a relationship with God is. We discussed the importance of having a relationship with God, and we discussed why, why, uh, why it is important to have and what the relationship looks like. And um, as we mentioned last time, uh, we got a lot of questions about, the relation, about being in a relationship with God. And uh, what I want to do is right away, I want to project the next few questions that we put into this topic of God engaging us and having a relationship with Him. So here are some of the questions that we received. Uh, how do I keep my strength and focus on Christ daily? What do you do if the fire inside you burns out? How can I reignite that fire? How can God help me with my mental health problems? How do I know if I'm going through spiritual warfare and how do I pray against it? What does it mean that the devil is attacking me and how do I respond? You know, these are... These are all good questions, and at first glance, when you look at these questions, they, you might not see anything common within these questions, but I think uh, if you think deeper and look deeper into these questions, you'll realize that all of these questions, they deal with uh, certain hardships in a relationship with God. They deal with perhaps some strained uh, relationship with Christ. Perhaps uh, a, a relationship where there are some problems, there's some pain, there's some frustrations. And, and so today we're going to talk about that. How do, you, how do you continue to build a relationship with God when it's hard to do that? When there are obstacles in your life, when there are things that are making it hard for you to be in a relationship with God. And so that is the topic today. God engages relationships part two. You know... I think you will agree that all relationships experience levels of struggle and tension. It may, might be friendship relationships, it might be marital relationships, it might be sibling relationships, parents and, fa- uh, parents and uh, children relationship. All of these relationships, they experience tensions, they re- experience struggles. And just like with the relationships between people, our relationship with God is not guaranteed to be perfect. Our relationship with God is not guaranteed to be um, like all, always without problems, without issues, always good. And those of you who have been Christians for a while, you know that throughout this re- relationship with Christ, you will experience moments of frustration. You will experience moments of pain, some moments of suffering, moments of struggle, Maybe even moments of doubt. You will experience that in your relationship with Christ, in your relationship with God. You will also re- experience moments of joy, moments of peace, and of course, moments of love. And just like there are valleys that we walk through, there are mountaintops that we get on. And even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, have you heard that phrase? It's from one of the Psalms by David who says that he had moments in his life when he walked through the valley of the shadow of death. And just like there are mountaintops, valleys are as real. So here's how I want us to to approach today's topic. Uh, All of you are familiar with my family, or at least most of you are familiar with my family. Uh, on that picture, you see my wife next to me, Ina, and our three children, the oldest being Ian, second one is Edward, uh, four, two and a half, and then we have the baby girl, Hannah, who is almost seven months old. Um, today, you see a family of five, yet the first eight years of our marriage, uh, it was just the two of us. 
uh, we oftentimes found ourselves walking through the valleys. And many of you know this story. Uh, some of you know it more than others. Some of you walked closest to us during these first eight years of our marriage. Before our firstborn, Ian, was, was, came to this life, right, was born, we had many other firstborns. We had many other children who, were, who we were pregnant with but were not born. For the first eight years of our marriage, we tried to have children right away. However, every time a pregnancy got to 12 weeks, there would be a miscarriage. And it, was, it, would happen often, uh, it would happen almost every year and sometimes multiple times a year. We, 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 say, we, we say to each other when we, we talk about children with Ina, we say we have way more than three children. We have over 10 children, and most of them are in heaven waiting for us. And, it, and it's, it's, it's a valley, of, it's an eight-year valley that we had to go through. A valley of confusion, uh, a valley of pain, a valley of loss, doubt, and of course, questioning. Lots and lots and lots of questions. And most of those questions started with one word. Which word? Why? <laughs> During these eight years, we asked a lot of why questions. Why is this happening to us? We are good people. We, we think we're good people, right? Why is this happening to us? Why is God allowing this in our lives? Didn't God say to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply? And here we are trying to follow that command, be fruitful and multiply. And for some reason, at 12 weeks, God stops that process. Why? Why are you sending this pain, suffering, struggle, confusion into our lives? Why are we in this valley? Why aren't our works being rewarded? Those of you who know myself, uh, me and my wife, you know that we, 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 were, we, were, we were very missional. Both of us, before we got married, we would travel around the world trying to help churches to be missional, evangelize. We're in ministry since we got married. We were always in ministry like, God, can't you see how good we are? You should reward us for being good and being faithful to you and working for you. And you're not. And better yet, here's a question we found ourselves asking. Why do bad people have kids and we don't? Why do people who have drugs have kids and us who are clean, we don't have kids? Why do parents who abuse their children, they, have, they get to have children and we don't? God, it's so unfair. <laughs> It's so not fair, Jesus. Why are we in this valley? And, and, so, and so we asked, and we prayed, and we read, and we asked, and we prayed, and we read, and it continued over and over and over for eight years. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you is not to say that we're good people who deserve kids. We're not. And we found out that quickly once we started having kids. Kids will bring out the worst in you. The reason I'm sharing this with you, because what I'm going to say, the way I want to answer these questions that were asked about struggle, about being in the valley, about losing the fire, about battling mental uh, health, battling spiritual uh, battles, what I'm going to share with you is our testimony. And actually, Ina played a big role in helping you put this sermon together. So what I'm going to share with you is actually a product of both of us working on this. And it's not even a sermon. It's a testimony of, the, of what we went through and what we learned. And hopefully that will help all of you to answer some of your questions. And the biggest thing that we learned, the biggest thing that we came that came out of this valley is not even the answer to why. We never got the answer to why it was happening to us. We got a different answer. And that answer is that God became closer to us. That through this valley, instead of giving us the answer why, He came close to us. 
we got to experience who God is on the bigger level. And one of the main things that we learned throughout this time period is that God is approachable. God is approachable in ev- to every human being. He's approachable in, in every situation. He's approachable in every context. He's a- approachable to all types of people. Jeremiah in 29 verses 12, 13 says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. That is God's promise, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. He is approachable to those who are on the mountaintop, and he is approachable to those who are in the valley of the shadow of death. He is approachable to those who are high up doing very good spiritually, and he is approachable to those who are broken, scared, confused, and angry. He is approachable. And you know, we often make a mistake. We think that God only hears people when they're in a good state of mind or in the good state of their heart. We make a mistake oftentimes thinking that people, that God only hears people who have these spiritual knowledge or some type of spiritual well-being. But what we've learned in our life and in our valley is that God is approachable in all stages of life. That He's approachable on the very bottom of that valley, halfway to that mountaintop and on the mountaintop. And so we came to God and we would pray to Him. We would pray to him all broken and angry. And we would tell him how upset we were. And we would tell him how angry we were. And we would tell him how unfair it is. And we would say, God, this is so not fair. And we would say, God, we are angry. God, we are upset. And we would literally say these things to him. And you know what? Never ever did we ever feel that God was rejecting that. We actually felt that God was getting even closer to us. And he was becoming even more approachable because we were actually giving him the honesty of our hearts. And we told him everything, how tough it is. We told him everything, how it was. And there was no instances when we felt rejected by him. So as we ask ourselves the question of how do I keep my strength and focus in Christ when I'm ready to give up? How do I keep the fire inside of me burning? How can I reignite that fire? You cannot reignite that fire. You cannot get closer to God unless God gets closer to you. And the only way for God to get closer to you is just to, it's just to let Him to get closer to you. Is, is, is be honest with Him and be open with Him. Keep this in mind, that it's not wrong to feel weak. It's not wrong to feel broken. It's not wrong to feel powerless. It's not wrong to feel tired. It's actually good to come to God when you are weak, when you are tired, to let Him to give you that strength. God receives you as you are. He hears you in your valley. He he sees you in your struggle. And He accepts you in your broken state. He accepts you in your broken state. Why? Why does he do that? Why does he hear you on the mountaintop, on the, in the middle of the mountain, in the valley? Why is, he do, why is he like that? Because he is God compassionate. He's God who is compassionate. And that's another thing we we, we kind of learn through this valley is that God is a God who has compassion, who is gracious, who is slow to anger, who abounds, he has a lot of love, a lot of truth, who keeps his loving kindness for thousands, who forgives our iniquities, who forgives our transgressions, who forgives our sins, And in his compassion, in his mercy, he continuously cleanses us. He continuously cleans us out and and gives us this, this different character and is closer to us. 
You know, mercy and compassion is actually rooted in the character of God. That is who he is. The passage that you see on the screen is a passage where God says this to the people of Israel who have rebelled against him, who have completely turned away from him. And he promises mercy and compassion to them. And he says, that is who I am. A God who created you and has all the right to wipe us off the face of the earth has compassion, has mercy, has love to forgive. And it is God's compassion that provides us with hope. It is his compassion that gives us hope in the valley. It is his compassion that gives us hope in our struggle. It is his compassion that gives us strength to keep going. Because we know that in his compassion, he's not far away. A compassionate parent is very close to their child when they're going through something tough. God is a compassionate father. Jesus is a compassionate savior who is not far away looking at you into the valley. He's right there with you in that valley. And he is taking you by the hand and he's ready to walk with you through that valley because he's God compassionate. In his compassion, he, under, he not only sees your pain, but he understands your pain. In his compassion, he provides. He provides you with strength to overcome those valleys. He provides you with direction to get out of those value, valleys. He provides you with resources to help you through that pain. In our case, God provided us with a community that help us to get through that valley. One of the ways that God came through for us was by sending people into our lives who would pray for us, sincerely pray for us. They would come and they wouldn't question the state that we're in, but they would say, I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. And you know, it wasn't easy to ask people to pray for us, but there were people who initiated that. And, and that's, that's, that's one of the first things that Satan tries to do. When you are going through the valley, when you're going through the struggle, when you're going through the battle, he tries to take you out of that community. He tries to take you out of that support group of Christians. He tries to tell you that there is shame for being in the struggle that you're in. He's telling you that there is shame for being in that valley. And if you go into the church, if you go and spend time in the circle of Christian people, you don't belong there because you're going through the valley. And he was telling us something similar. He was saying, you don't have children. It's a shame to not have children. Here's what people will think. Here's what people will say. Here's how, pe what people, how people will look at you. And there were times when there were church events we did not want to attend. There were services we did not want to attend. There were people we did not want to see because Satan was telling us that you need to be removed from it so that you don't feel the shame. But God wants to put you into that community. A community, a Christian community, is God's resource to help you go through the valleys. And so instead of distancing ourselves, we opened the doors of our house to a small group. And we said, we're just going to offer our house. We have rooms with no kids, but we have a house where we can host a group of people to study the Bible. Where we can host... For, for people who are maybe also going through different valleys and different struggles. And guess what? People came. And guess what? We realized that everyone is going through a valley. <laughs> that everyone has a struggle. That we're not the special ones. And that was, uh, that was really a resource that God provided us in His compassion. He provided a group of people who we studied the Bible with, who we prayed with, who we shared with, who we opened our hearts to each other, and God answered. And God answered. 
together with a group, we began to pray for the miracles. And, you know, God used that group. God used that community. And in that community, everyone ended up being pregnant. He used it to give us strength to go through that valley. And he, he kind of took us out of that valley together with that group. So anytime, you know, some of you may be asking this question, well, like, how do I know that Satan is attacking me? One of the major factors to keep in mind is if you don't want to be among other Christians, that is him attacking you. If you're looking for excuses to miss an opportunity to be in a relationship with other Christians, he's attacking you. God wants you in a community. Satan wants you out of that community. God wants you around other people who will support you. Satan wants you out of that so you don't have the support. And, you know, we have so many excuses today to not attend church, to not attend events, to not be in a ministry, to not open the doors of our house and say, you know, I'm busy. I have children. Uh, I don't have children, you know. I, uh, uh, I have work. I have a vacation. I have things to do. My house is not clean. Uh, this and that. I don't have a cute dress to wear to church. Like all these random excuses we come up with to be outside of that community. And I, and I strongly believe that that is one of the main tools that Satan uses to take you away from God. You know, it took us a while to open to our community and be open about it. We talked to our community group. After that, we asked pastors to pray for us. And when I stepped in as a lead pastor, I, we, we were here on stage with my wife, and we kind of just told the whole church, pray for us. And, and that was, we, you, we, we, with every instant, we felt, we, feel, we, feel, we felt this instant relief. Like the weight is off our shoulders. We're not alone. There are people who will carry this weight with us. And most importantly, we felt the power of letting go of control and trusting that God is in control. And every time we shared, we, we are letting go of trying to control the situation by ourselves and letting God control it. Psalm 33 reminds us that a king is not saved by his great army. A giant is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a vain hope for victory. Despite its great might, it cannot save. Behold, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our helper and defender. Our hearts shall rejoice in him, and we have hope in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us as we have set our hope on you. And you know, we've tried so many different doctors and specialists. We even went to the popular San Francisco area, right? Where all the wise people are. And all the good doctors, Berkeley educators, or wherever they educated, right? No one could give us an answer. Not that they didn't, not that they were giving us answers. They didn't even have an answer. They didn't know what's happening. And we tried many different methods. We tried vitamins. We tried medicine. We tried different tests. And we even tried some natural, uh, all kinds of grandma recommendations. You know, it didn't work. We had no answer. And that's when we finally said, okay, God, you're in control. We're, we're not going to let this drive our life. We're not going to let the valley be the definition of who we are in, in, in Christ. And there was something powerful in letting go. You know, control is something that's not so easy for us to let go of. You know why? Because I have the strength. I can do it. I have the health. I can do it. I have the money, I can reach it, I can buy it, I can have it, I can achieve it. I have the knowledge, I have the brain, I can do it myself. 
And so it's really hard for us to let go of that control. And when we were in that valley, God taught us that He is sovereign. That He is in control of everything that's happening in our lives. The definition of this word sovereign is basically the fact that God is, has the power, that God has the wisdom and authority to do anything He chooses within His creation. So He is in complete control. That's what it means that God is sovereign. He is in complete control. And no matter what challenges or difficulties we face, they're ultimately under the control and direction of God. So how does knowing that God is in control everything help us to overcome adversity? How does knowing that God is sovereign help us in going through spiritual attacks? One verse, a popular verse that many of you know and many of you have quoted before in your life, Romans 8.28 where Paul says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. When you know that God is in control, when you realize that, when you let Him have control, when you give up your own control, you realize that God has bigger plans. You realize that God is working your valley so that overall your life is going to have a bigger purpose. When we are in the valley, you know what we look at? We look at the mountains in front of us. When we're in the valley, you know what we look at? We try to look at those mountaintops and we start wishing that we were up there. When we're at the valley, we don't see the full picture. But when you realize that God is the almighty sovereign God, He's the one who sees what is happening in the valley. He sees the mountaintops, and he sees what is happening on the other side of the mountain. He has different perspective. He has a bigger plan. He has a bigger purpose. And when you realize that, a certain peace comes into your life. That I'm not alone. That I cannot control the situation. He is in control and he is walking with me through this valley. And he sees the other side of the mountain. He sees what is waiting for me on the other side. He has a bigger perspective. He has a better plan. And he has a greater purpose. Through Isaiah, God reminds us again of that same principle. Where God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is the highest and the best professional in every area of our life. And He has the best laid out plans to make things work out in my life. And I choose to trust Him. That is what recognizing that God is sovereign means. I choose to trust Him to control the situation in my life. I choose to let go of trying to control it by myself. Why? Because I'm assured of His plans. I'm assured that He has a purpose. I know that He has a better plan. How do I know it? Because I know that He is faithful. God is faithful. The reason I'm assured of His plans, the reason I'm assured of His purposes is because I know that He is faithful. He has done things in my life before and He will do things in my life again. Those who know Your name trust in You. For You, O Lord, do not abandon those who search for You. It's a promise that God does not abandon those who search for Him. God is unchanging. He's true to His Word. He keeps His promises and will keep His promises. God being faithful means that He can be trusted to do what He says He's going to do. God is faithful means that He can be trusted to never let you down 
or, embar or embarrass you for believing in Him. It may be hard to receive a no from God right now. And, and I know some of you are going through some real struggles, and some of you may not, but I'm pretty sure that most of you have either a smaller or bigger adversity or struggle in your life. Some of you are praying for your own health. Some of you are praying for health of your family members. Some of you are praying for guidance. Some of you are praying for your unsaved spouse. Some of you are praying to have a spouse. Some of you are praying for your children to know God. Some of you are for your job. Some of you are praying to just have peace in your life. Some of you really want to let go of the anxiety and the stress that is bothering you. Trust that God is a faithful God who has a bigger perspective for you, who has a bigger and better purpose for you. God is faithful, and He will come through. We're grateful that God gifted us the three children that we have, and they're amazing three children. But most importantly, we're grateful that God showed us who He is through that valley. It, it's, this testimony is not about us. Okay, I want to I make this clear that the reason I shared this testimony with you today is because we're grateful that God showed His compassion through this valley. We're grateful that God is in control. We're grateful that God was and is approachable. We're grateful that He is faithful and we know that he will always be faithful. And guess what? I'm sure we're not done yet. After one valley, after another mountaintop, there's another valley, there's another mountaintop. And it's an ongoing process of going through the valleys, getting to know God more, getting on those mountaintops, going to another valley. So how do you go through those valleys. Seek God. Look for God. Look and, 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 and be open with Him so that He may be close to you. You know, God's faithfulness is most reflective in His salvation plan. You can see that God is faithful because He had a plan to come to this earth to save you from your sins, and he fulfilled that plan. He fulfilled that plan. And so we know that he is faithful even in what he promises us. He's faithful to be with you in the valley. He's faithful to be compassionate. He's faithful to be available, approachable. He's faithful in our lives. Now, I was recently reading the book of Job. If you haven't read the book of Job, I would really encourage you to read that book. And I would encourage you to try to read it all in one sitting. When you have a few minutes, try to read the whole book. There's, there's an, there's a, so Job is known as the guy who went through probably the, the worst struggles except for Jesus, right? Uh, he, he lost everything. He lost his whole family. He lost his his loved ones, he lost everything he had, he had possessions. And in his struggle, in his questioning of everything that's happening, I noticed a few, I noticed this phrase that he would repeat. He says, at one point, if only there was a mediator between us, someone who could bring us together. The mediator could make God stop beating me, and I would no longer live in terror of his punishment. Then I could speak to him, to God, without fear, but I cannot do that in my own strength. Job was looking for a mediator who would stop God from punishing him and through whom Job could talk to God. And again, he says, I need someone to mediate between God and me. 
as a person mediates between friends. And I was reading that, and I caught myself thinking, how awesome it is that we don't need to ask for a mediator. We already have one. That when you're going through that valley, you have a mediator, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for you so that you could talk to God, so that God would be closer to you, so that you would uh, be forgiven and you would not face the punishment. Who would mediate between you and God and you could talk to God as friends. And that's what Jesus does. He became that mediator so that you could have a connection to God. So you could have a relationship with God. So you could be reconciled to God and be close to Him. I hope this, again, I want to call it a testimony. I hope this testimony of our valley will help all of you to, as you go through your own valleys, to seek out God. And, and it's okay to be open. It's okay to be honest. It's okay to be honest with what you're going through, what you're feeling, what you're thinking, and let Him speak into your life. And let Him control the situation. May God bless you in that. Let's bow our heads, and we'll spend some time in prayer. Now, some of you may be here today, you your whole struggle is that you haven't even prayed to Jesus yet. You haven't even prayed to God to forgive you. And, and, and maybe, you know, throughout the last few weeks, or even today, God is speaking to you and, and you want to talk to Him. Just, just start by asking for forgiveness for your sins. That's what we call repentance, right? Where... You ask Jesus to forgive you. Jesus, I believe that you came to save sinners like me. I ask that you forgive me. Forgive me my sins and save me. Be the mediator between me and God. Bring me closer to God. And all of you who are going through a valley of some sort, just, just know that you can be honest with God with your feelings. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you're upset. Maybe you're irritated. Maybe you are impatient. Maybe you're losing trust of that He's going to take you through that valley. Just say that to Him. Be honest with Him. He is approachable. You can come to Him boldly. And ask for guidance. Ask for clarity. Ask for direction. Jesus, we give you the control of our valley. We give you the, the, the keys to the driver's we, tr driving wheel or to the car so that I don't want to be in the driver's seat. I want you to be the driver. I'm done trying to change the situation on my own. I ask that you, Jesus, who died on the cross, who's powerful to change lives, that you change my life. Lord, teach me as I go through my struggle be, to be close to you. Be closer to me, I ask. I acknowledge that you're sovereign, that you're in control of everything. And I trust that you have a bigger purpose, that you have the better perspective. And whatever is on the other side of that mountain, I trust that you have a good plan for me. I'm letting go of control, letting you control it. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Folks, let's stand and let's continue in worship.